And then with this, we can start the um, session today. It's a great pleasure um, for me to welcome Keda Narayan as our speaker today. This is the start of a new um, regular series at the virtual pub that we are organizing together with the Volume EM community. We in January had a great uh, introduction to the Volume EM community from Paul Vercade at the virtual pub. And I'll, um, that also was recorded and I'll share the link to that YouTube video um, in a minute. So. In case you haven't heard of this initiative, uh, you can check out their website or you can check out that video. And we're really happy that Kedar is now um, the first speaker in this uh, official series. And um, to introduce him, uh, he has a research background in chemistry, pathology, and biophysics. And he had received his PhD in immunology from Johns Hopkins University before working as a postdoc at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, where he worked in the development of FIPSEM as a tool for subcellular imaging. He is now a senior scientist and group leader at the Center for Molecular Microscopy at the Frederick National Laboratory and National Cancer Institute in the US. So we're not just happy that Kedar is joining us at all today, we are especially happy that he's joining us at a very unreasonably early time in the morning uh, where he is. Um, so yeah, and we'll hear today about volume electron microscopy and concepts, correlations and computations with a specific focus on the computations part. So thank you, Kira, for joining us. The floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Um, what I'll do today is talk about some of the work that we've been doing in the recent past. Uh, as Johanna mentioned, uh, first, just a quick check. Everyone can see my PowerPoint slide, I assume? Yes, we can see it. Looks great. So uh, Paul Vakada, as, as Johanna mentioned, had, had spoken a little bit about the volume EM community. What I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about some basic concepts and uh, vocabularies and ideas in volume electron microscopy, uh, just generally what it is, because I understand there's going to be a lot of people who are outside of the community. Uh, the original intent was to talk about some correlative microscopy from the wet lab side in our group uh, and then move on to computations. But as I was putting in my slides late last night, um, I realized that there's a lot of very uh, a lot of new stuff that we've done that I'm very excited to share with the community specifically because they are resources. And especially with computational resources, the more that people use it and try it and understand what it is, the better it is for everybody. So uh, I'm, I'm going to flip forward to the computational aspect. And then if we have time, come back to some uh, uh, interesting wet lab stories. OK, so with that, I'll get started. Um, as I mentioned, uh, a quick introduction, a few biological insights if we get time from the wet lab, but really uh, focusing on trans transferring from images to insights with advances in deep learning. And specifically, I'm going to talk about two of the tools that we have, have just released. Uh, they're called MitoNet, which is a generalist uh, deep learning model for automatic segmentation of mitochondria, and Empanada, which is a plugin that really allows for point and click kind of um, running of this model. So what I'd like folks to take away from this meeting really is get a feel for what volume EM is, where we are, what we can do and what we can't, uh, and really some developments that are there in the deep learning uh, aspect of things. And finally, if I get the chance, I'll talk a little bit about some of the correlative microscopy work. So start with the basics. What's volume electron microscopy anyway? The first thing that I always tell people is it's not cryo EM. So cryo EM is you know, structural studies of protein complexes, whereas volume electron microscopy or volume EM refers to not just one approach, but a group of uh, scanning and transmission electron microscopy approaches. Recently, we've also absorbed X-ray uh, microscopy approaches in this. But essentially what it allows us to do is to interrogate cell and tissue ultrastructure in three dimensions. We're looking at significantly larger volumes, so microns to millimeter volume scales and at nanometer level resolutions. So if you have a graph between XYZ resolutions and size of features, you can see that you have a series of overlapping approaches, electron tomography, FibSEM, serial block phase, array tomography, and finally X-ray microscopy that uh, span a very large breadth of resolutions and uh, size of features which makes it very useful for biological research. So how does this really work? When you take a conventional scanning electron microscope, 
it conveys depth, but actually it is a 2D and not a 3D image, right? So with transmission EM or DEM, uh, you essentially section your cell and you take a projection image and that's how you get a single 2D image. But new detector technologies allow in the scanning electron microscope images that look pretty much like a DEM image. So that level of quality, especially when you're looking at, at cells and tissue. The advantage, of course, is that the automation of the process of sectioning and imaging and so on allows for high throughput. So rather than do you know single section at a time and image, uh, a lot of the volume EM approaches that rely on scanning EM uh, are, are, are allow for high throughput. And just I'm just going to plug this paper here. It's it's a a reasonably good primer of how to do of how to approach volume electron microscopy. So. Connectomics is something that many of you may have heard of, and I would say that that's probably the best known use, known use case for large scale volume EM, right? So for a complete wiring diagram, what you need is you need a high resolution of electron microscopy, but you also need to be able to capture giant volumes to get complete cells. And finally, you need heavy duty computational to allow annotation and segmentation of these large volumes in 3D. And so, Connectomics is a significantly more mature field, um, and a lot of work, high-profile work, has been done in the recent past, which I would urge you to, uh, to read. Volume electron microscopy uh, is a little more than just connectomics. It's not just neuronal uh, tissue. It's now the application of these concepts and these technological advances to a wider range of cells and tissues. And if you'll see the, the number of publications, right, we're in the midst actually of an inflection point. There's a lot of interest coming in uh, as we find out what volume EM can do uh, for cell biology discovery. So what I'm gonna do now is go over just a very quick, quickly, a couple of movies to describe a few popular volume EM approaches. So let's say you want to image adherent cells, for example, with, volume electron microscopy, and you don't want to image just one cell, but an entire field of cells. And so these kinds of bubble gummy looking things are the adherent cells. The idea is that, um, let me just play that, there you go. So if you have the cells that are grown in vitro, for example, you do your regular heavy metal stain fixation, resin embedding, and so on. You then trim the block which the cells are embedded in until they're about a millimeter across. and the idea with array tomography is that you do sectioning, very thin sectioning of these on the block to create uh, serial sections, which are then put on a wafer and they're imaged in the SEM. But if you take that block and now do the ser automated serial sectioning, uh, put it on a grid tape and image it by TEM, you essentially get the same thing, right? Which is a stack of high resolution 2D EM images, which you can then align and segment, which capture not just one cell, but an entire field of cells. And so the idea is that um, we can then segment these out, even though we don't have the approaches completely down, and then eventually get to quantitative analyses of this field of cells. So this is... Um, a quick work through of array tomography and grid tape DEM. But you have uh, two other approaches called serial block face SEM and focused ion beam SEM or FibSEM that allow you to image uh, individual cells. <clears throat> so they work with at slightly lower volumes. So the first steps are the same, right? You fix heavy metal stain and resin embed your cells. But this time what you do is you introduce the block into the EM in serial block phase, there is a microtome blade in the SEM chamber. And so the SEM does the imaging, the blade takes off a thin section, and then that reveals a new section, which is then imaged again by the SEM. You scrape off a little bit and so on and so forth. You get a stack of high resolution EM images. With FibSEM, you use a focused ion beam to do your milling. And this is this blue beam that's coming orthogonally to the plane of the resin embedded cell. But the idea is the same. You do it in the orthogonal direction, but you still get a high resolution stack of EM images. Either way, what it allows you to do is to build a three-dimensional reconstruction at high resolution of the cell. And in this case, what you could do, presumably, is to take uh, intracellular features, perhaps like mitochondria, and try to get some quantitative or at least qualitative analyses of what's happening. So that's a very quick run through of 
for volume EM approaches. But why do we care so much about 3D, right? And high resolution. The idea is that even if it's a simple cube, the geometry of a three-dimensional object when imaged in 2D can give you incomplete or even misleading information, right? So a 2D images, image of a cube, depending on how you cut it, could look vastly different. And if that's true for a cube, you can imagine for mitochondria, for example, it's very much the case. So it's only in textbooks that they look like nice kidney bean shapes. In real life, they're very complex, which means that you need to be imaged, you need to be able to image them at high resolution and in, a, in their entirety in 3D. And this is what volume EM does. So while you sacrifice a little bit of resolution compared to conventional transmission EM or TEM, what a technique like FibSem does is it allows you to get that kind of resolution, not just in a single two dimensional plane, but in all three planes. And so we're all like most other people are caught in this triangle of resolution versus field of view versus time. Uh, and like most other cases, you know, better resolutions and signal to noise is possible with longer dwell time and appropriate pixel sampling. But typically we accept that for the scanning electron beam for biological samples, you can't quite achieve TM resolutions. But on the flip side, you get a lot more information from the entire volume. So practically, how does this work? Uh, there's a volume EM pipeline starting from your experiment or your study. You then do a sample prep protocol, then have something that, and then a protocol that will generate a specimen, which is ready to go in the microscope. You actually then acquire your images, uh, resulting in raw data, which are then processed, and then finally uh, reconstructed into a volume, which can then be segmented for downstream visualization or analysis. These pipelines are complex and they vary by project. So, if your aim, finally, as we look at it, is the efficient quantitative analysis of three-dimensional nanoscale reconstructions of tissue and cell architecture. That we think it should be the aim for volume electron microscopy projects. That means that you have to have your technology down. And this is my favorite sort of uh, five pillar slide, which is volume EM uh, approaches rest on five technological pillars. You've got to have very good sample prep protocols make sure that those appropriate samples are imaged efficiently by volume EM. In case you have multimodal imaging, you've got to be able to process and correlate these volumes appropriately. And finally, you've got to uh, get features of interest out from the volume. And then you need to be able to know what to do with all of these data because you do generate a lot of data with volume EM. And so today I'm gonna uh, actually not talk so much about the correlative microscopy. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit uh, on account of time. First handle uh, some of the work that we've done recently to tackle the problem of segmentation and visualization. Okay, so the takeaways for volume EM concepts are very easy. Uh, it basically allows you for three-dimensional imaging of cellular ultrastructure. Uh, and in, in exchange for these large volumes, you have to um, allow for a slight reduction in resolutions, but you get massive uh, automation. Um, and volume EM is not just connectomics, it's really growing to the point where it is, uh, we are able to answer many questions in cell biology. Finally, as Paul has pointed out previously, uh, please go to volumeem.org uh, and we have an infrastructure page. So if you have volume EM instruments, serial block phase, FIBSEM, et cetera, et cetera, please add your institute to the infrastructure page and join us. Uh, we're a growing community and we're very friendly, I promise you. Okay. Um, I am going to, with your permission, skip ahead over some very exciting correlative work where we show that we can do cryocorrelative microscopy of high pressure frozen samples. Uh, so I'm just going to, for those of you who can read very, very quickly, uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've seen these slides now. Okay. What I'm going to skip ahead now and talk about is the volume EM segmentation challenge. So in this pipeline, uh, the experimental pipeline that I presented some time, a few slides ago, it's very clear if you're in the field, we know where the bottleneck is. It's in visualization and, uh, and analysis, right? Why is that? With fluorescence microscopy, as many of you know, you largely see what you're looking for. You want to see mitochondria, you label mitochondria. Uh, you want to see ER, you, you label a protein in the ER, for example. 
And so you essentially get your feature view and a black background. But with electron microscopy, you capture the ultrastructure of everything, which means that accurately and precisely extracting just your features of interest from these large information rich, high resolution uh, grayscale images is very, very important, right? And this is what we call segmentation. Currently, segmentation is still the rate limiting step in volume electron microscopy. So this is a, uh, an aspect of great interest in the field and there have been important machine learning and deep learning based software solutions that allow automated segmentation. But the fact is it's still uh, slow and manual. And so um, what you see is that often this is something that you give your, your intern and this is often the rate limiting step, right? It's, it's slow, it's manual, and frankly, it's often boring. So as a result, a lot of the technological advances have left behind uh, this kind of uh, analysis and visualization simply because of this bottleneck. So how do we attack this? The idea, about why we want to attack it in the first place is that if we want to transform volume electron microscopy from representative observations that are qualitative, if we want to transform it to quantitative analyses of these large data, and not just in connectomics, but for any given cell biological system, automated segmentation of any feature of choice from any volumium data set is a critical step. And so, this is where artificial intelligence or AI comes in. So let's say your problem is, you know, find the mitochondria in the image. This is what we wanted to attack. If you see an EM image, everybody in this talk will know exactly where the mitochondria are, even if it's just edge cases. But AI algorithms typically aren't there yet. So automation is the only way to segment features in an unbiased and efficient way, but current algorithms aren't very generalizable. What does that mean? So very quickly, uh, I just wanna go over uh, some basic terminology. Uh, machine learning is basically where you have an algorithm that can perform a task without any quote unquote human rules. And, and deep learning is basically just machine learning on steroids, right? You've got these stacked layers uh, that allow you to uh, attack these problems. And um, what we want to do for mitochondria is something called instant segmentation, right? So semantic segmentation, for example, which is also very popular, is in a field of view, here are all my pixels that are assigned to the class mitochondria. They all will be labeled as mitochondria. Whereas instant segmentation is labeling each individual mitochondrion or an instance of the mitochondrion individually. So mitochondria one, two, three, et cetera, et cetera, in a field of view. So we keep talking about deep learning. Um, what does deep learning really do? So very, very briefly, or uh, perhaps I'm oversimplifying this, essentially what it does is you, you take your input, which is essentially a grayscale image of a mitochondrion on a background of, with, a, uh, with a background of cellular uh, ultrastructure, you start getting uh, features, simple features that are in the imaging plane. And with these layers, you start getting to more and more complex concepts until you finally get to a concept of mitochondria. That is to say the model, the deep learning model understands what a, uh, the concept of a mitochondria is, not simply what, it, what the edges are in a particular spot. And this is something that humans just do even without thinking. And that's where we want our deep learning models to be. So there have been some spectacular successes. Um, I've just put in a couple of high profile papers that have come out recently where you can, where uh, researchers have used deep learning models to segment out features in a cell, multiple organelles, including mitochondria. So what's the problem? Here's the dirty secret. Typically an automatic, uh, an automatic segmentation pipeline goes like this. You acquire your giant volumium data, you manually segment a small subvolume, and you use, so basically you, you take a subvolume of your data set, you manually paint what the mitochondria are, for example. You use that to train a deep learning model, and then you do what's called inference. So once the model presumably learns what the mitochondria is, you run inference of the, on the rest of the volume EM data set. 
And this usually works, right? You, you, the subset is used to train the model. It then runs inference on the entire model. But the problem is when you run inference on that model on a different data set, you get very poor results. So what that means, for example, is if you take a, a subset of a volume EM data set of a healer cell and you segment out the mitochondria, you then train a very fancy uh, UNEP, you then um, run the model on the entire volume of that same HeLa cell, it'll work fine. Now you take that model and then you run it on a muscle cell, it'll fail horribly, right? Or you try to recognize ER in the HeLa cell, it'll fail even worse. And this is the problem that we call generalization. So the holy grail in volume EM is a generalist or universal deep learning model. For us, we want a generalist deep learning model that can segment mitochondria, not just in one uh, particular volume EM data set, but any EM image. And why aren't we there yet? Our hypothesis was that for the training methods that we use, we typically have just a limited set of data distributions. And so the range of contexts available to a model result in poor generalizability. And now in retrospect, this sort of makes sense, right? If a, if a deep learning model has only seen mitochondria from say healer cells that have been high pressure frozen and staying in a particular way, it doesn't know yet what mitochondria can be. And so when you uh, run inference on this model on unrelated data sets, it performs poorly. So our first insight was provide your deep learning model data in more number of contexts and remove the constraints of supervision, right? So what this means is this, you have a naive model. It's just some guy on the street. What we really want is a mitochondrial segmentation model that is like Michael Phelps, right? This multiple Olympic gold medal winning performer. But we expected to make this jump what we said is, well, why don't we just give the model an idea of what a swimming pool is before trying to win the Olympic gold medal in the 50 meter freestyle? This experience without any task attached, without any pressure is called pre-training. So the idea was that we pre-train a model on a general task, just generic feature recognition in EM images, and then use those parameters for organelle segmentation. So last year, we published a paper to test this hypothesis. We um, curated a relevant, heterogeneous, information-rich, and non-redundant uh, EM data set of conventional uh, EM, both 2D and 3D. And this is, uh, it was run through a pipeline that created half a million two-dimensional EM image patches. And then we essentially did uh, something called unsupervised pre-training, uh, and you can read the paper for more details. <clears throat> it came out in eLife last year, and the idea was to test it against uh, available benchmarks. So the data set sampled many different imaging approaches, different resolutions, uh, different uh, tissue origins, et cetera, et cetera. And then what we did was rather than just dump data onto the model, we curated it. Volume EM, you can imagine your n minus one slice looks the same as your n and your n plus one, almost. So you want to deduplicate all those images to take out redundancy. You also want to get rid of uninformative patches, so just empty resin, for example. You want to get rid of those. Um, and so finally, you get something that is very relevant and information rich and non redundant, right? So this is the unlabeled data set. And what we saw is that without any a priori knowledge, the model was able to recognize organelles as relevant features in this image. Of course, it doesn't know what a mitochondria is or ER is, but the neurons were firing at that level. And uh, these, this kind of pre-training also resulted in more resilience for the model. So when you added signal to noise, it performed better. So clearly we were able to show last year that pre-training generates more robust models, which appear to uh, perceive features that are relevant to cellular data. And this is just some data just to show that it actually works, right? So if you don't pre-train a model, it's called random initialization, versus if you pre-train a model on something called ImageNet, this is just a series of stop signs and cats and landscapes and so on, um, 
just pre-training, even if it's just to random images, does improve model performance. But then if you pre-train on a relevant cellular EM data, perhaps intuitively, we show that those models tend to perform very well. And they perform so well that they uncover human errors in the benchmark ground truths. So then we knew we were really onto something, right? So pre-training we showed clearly helps to build more resilient models. And the next step was, well, we went back to the data and we made two other important observations. Number one, curating the data set improves performance. So rather than just throwing a whole bunch of data at the model, this kind of curation to get rid of excess stuff, non-information rich stuff was really useful. And importantly, pre-training on diverse data was better than on massive homogenous data. So rather than, let's say you have a, uh, uh, an option to, gener uh, to train a model on one terabyte of neuronal data versus one gigabyte of very massively variable, uh, variably sourced data, always go for the latter. Um, I'm making the one terabyte and gigabyte numbers, but you get my point. So that was our second insight. Rather than dense segmentation of a few volumes, segment sparsely and widely. So what we did um, was we uh, downloaded every publicly available volume EM data set until November of last year. And this is something like two petabytes. We then uh, applied a cutoff to prevent overrepresentation of giant data sets. And we ran it through the pipeline that I spoke about a few slides back. And so that resulted in one and a half million image patches, each of which was completely distinct from the other, but had relevant high resolution information. And this is what we call CEM 1.5M, right? Cellular electron microscopy, 1.5 million images. Now on top of this, this is what's new uh, in this paper, is we stacked the actual label data set for training. Remember the 1.5 million data set is completely unlabeled. On top of that, we added what we call CEM MitoLab, which is just mitochondria labeled. Um, here again, we, we took a subset of 22,000 images and did instance labeling. That is to say, every mitochondria had a different label within an image batch, generating something like 135,000 mitochondrial images. And this was done uh, with crowdsourcing uh, on the Zooniverse platform. Um, and we had uh, a bunch of high school students uh, that, that um, were, were able to participate in this, about 30 odd. And what we saw is that the high school students actually did better with time, um, except for a couple. Um, and we then applied a consensus algorithm to their segmentation. So every image was annotated by 10 individual students. We then applied a consensus algorithm to get a consensus uh, segmentation. And then finally, we did a very quick proofreading. And this is how we generated CEM MitoLab, which again is highly heterogeneous based on pixel size, based on imaging approach, right? FibSem, TEM, zero block phase, zero section, TEM, array tomography, electron tomography, et cetera, et cetera. It was variable by organism. It was uh, also highly variable uh, based on tissue origin. And of course, it was also split between isotropic and anisotropic data, as well as conventional and high pressure frozen samples. So it's a highly heterogeneous data set and it passes the sniff test or, or eyeball test. If you look at the data, the mitochondria just look different. The context just look different. So it felt right. Most importantly, these two resources are open and available for anyone to use, right? They're on Empire. Please uh, download them and use them for your own approaches if you need to. But before you go ahead and do that, let me show you what we did with these data sets. Oh, by the way, a bonus is please check out the Excel file with CM MitoLab. It has detailed metadata, which means that in the future, if you want to derive just a subset of mitochondria that came from liver or mitochondria that only came from FibSem imaging, you can do this now. So having those kinds of metadata is very, very important. Please see it on the upload. So what did we do with these data? We applied panoptic segmentation. Very quickly, uh, if you look at an image, um, semantic segmentation just says, well, there are people, there is beach, there is uh, water, and there is sky. Instant segmentation says there's person one, person two, person three. Whereas panoptic 
uh, essentially combines these two in the sense that it tells you that there are three people on a background of sky, water, and sand. And this, if you think about it, is very similar to our problem in mitochondria, right? You want each individual mitochondria, but you want it on a background of cellular stuff. And so that's what we used, and that's how we generate MitoNet. So the input is obviously um, the grayscale images and the label map, and then <clears throat> the output is actually three things. It's a semantic segmentation. So mitochondria label versus background. It's the object centers and the offsets. So all of these three things are spit out by the model, which are then combined to form the instance segmentation. And you'll see a, a link to the paper. You can see the details there. All of this is done in 2D, and this is a critical point. We didn't want to get into something that is really big and bulky and do these fancy three-dimensional 3D units and so on. This is processed in a 2D stack. So it assumes that a volume EM a reconstruction is like a 2D stack. So it works in say uh, XY and goes through the volume. And then it also allows you for isotropic data, it does the same thing in XZ and YZ. And then it combines those two uh, to give a consensus three-dimensional reconstruction. So this is how we did it for volume EM. And, and of course, it, because it's intrinsically a 2D model, it will work for two-dimensional TEM images as well. So the pipeline is you pre-train on CEM 1.5, you then train on CEM MitoLab, you generate your generalist model MitoNet, and then you do the post-processing, which is the orthogonal inference and filtering that I mentioned. Uh, and then, well, does this work? That was insight number three. If you claim to have a generalist model, you've got to test with multiple benchmark. And so that was <clears throat> uh, the, the third deliverable that we have uploaded now onto Empire, which is a series of highly variable um, mitochondrial benchmark. You can see from these GIFs, they look quite different. And if you quantitate what they look like, uh, you can tell that their volume, branch length, et cetera, et cetera, are quite different. And the salivary data set, which is on the bottom row in the middle, even humans barely can tell where the mitochondria is. For us, this is the Mount Everest of uh, mitochondrial segmentation challenges. So how does MitoNet perform? It performs really well on extremely different data sets. So just to clarify, this is the exact same deep learning model without any fine tuning, without any changes at all, the exact same DL model was able to perform very well if you look at the IOU scores. Um, with salivary gland, it actually did not do well, but if you do something called fine tuning, which is um, you, you add a few specific labeled image batches on that data set, then you recover very good IOUs. And again, F1 scores are just another way to measure this. Uh, essentially, MitoNet does very, very well. And if you look at, always you've got to look at, look at the data and see if you're right, what you can see is that the prediction of MitoNet is almost always pixel perfect. The mistakes that it makes are with merge and split errors. When mitochondria are very, very close together, sometimes it makes the mistake of combining them into a single mitochondria or vice versa. And that actually was the main reason that we got slightly lower F1 scores, not because of um, completely missing mitos, et cetera, et cetera. And the proof is right here, right? Does all of this work? Um, so we compared this kind of pre-training and training on this very diverse heterogeneous data set, we compared it to other training and uh, on other data sets. So for example, um, Heinrich et al. Was, was a high profile paper that came out from Genalia uh, that looks very, very beautiful, but it's a very, very small data set. Um, and that performs, that's this line right here, it performs very badly on these heterogeneous data sets, which tells you that size matters, but it's not just size. MitoEM is another data set where you have mitochondrial uh, label maps on a huge number of data, but they're all from neuronal tissue, which means they're very homogenous. And what we were able to show is that just our crowdsource label, so this is literally high school students with one hour of training without any expert correction, were able to outperform uh, the MitoEM. 
And of course, our final CEM Mito Lab, which is you know combining the students' annotations into a consensus and then doing the expert proofreading, uh, that's the brown line. Uh, it, it performs be better than anything else. So this just shows you that, and by the way, this is on, uh, what I'm showing you is the mean uh, F1 scores or IOUs on all the benchmarks, there are six of them. So that shows you that the CM Mito Lab works on heterogeneous data sets. So all of this is fine, but how can users actually use MitoNet? Um, ultimately, this is the proof of the pudding, right? Um, and so we release Empanada. This is a Napari plugin. Many of you may know Napari already. It is a uh, quite a useful uh, platform that's still a little bit under development, but for various reasons, we, we went with Napari and we have <clears throat> a plugin on it. Um, try it now. I promise you, Go uh, click on this QR code. The documentation for Empanada is excellent. It, it is very, very good. The aim was uh, that anybody should be able to use Empanada. Um, this is how it works. So here's the Napari background, right? You can open your volume EM image. Uh, this is a stack view. This is just some random cell. Uh, you go through the stack. Now you open the EM, uh, the M, uh, Empanada plugin, right? And you say you want to run inference on MitoNet. Boom. That's in real time. That's how fast it is. On any image, you just one click and every mitochondrion is segmented out instantly. So please give it a shot. Uh, people have already tried it and we've gotten feedback about how this is working. Uh, I hope it'll work as well for you as it has worked in our hands and in other people's hands. Um, how about various data sets? This is in real time, again, completely unrelated data sets, right? Um, columnar epithelia, tetrahymena, HeLa cells, again, in real time, completely unrelated data sets on the exact same model gives you results um, that, that you can see. Muscle cells, for example, uh, all of this, um, you know, MitoNet seems to perform very, very well for these heterogeneous data. So that's, I showed you representative examples in 2D. What about in 3D? What's the actual performance? Is this slowed down? Here's the biggest advantage because everything is done in two dimensions and then propagated through the volume, it's computationally very light. So on a single GPU 16 uh, gig workstation, we were able to segment out 15,000 mitochondria in one and a half hours on a kidney volume and 61,000 of mitochondria in a liver volume in about three and a half hours. And the data that you're seeing here has not been touched by, by humans, there's no manual painting correction. Of course, it ran through a, the ortho inference and the filtering to get rid of small, very, very small dots. But apart from that, it's just untouched. And in comparison, uh, before we were able to do this automatically, two interns working for a month were able to do two cells, 280 mitochondria. So this we think is a vast improvement on uh, the current state of the art. And again, I, I, I must underline, it's the exact same model used on these two without any two completely different heterogeneous data sets without any fine tuning or tweaking. So as I mentioned to you, MitoNet is pixel perfect very often, but makes some split and merge errors. So Empanada allows you to correct for those. Let's say, uh, this is a, a good example, right? You can see that it's got a pixel perfect uh, in terms of the edges of the mitochondria, but it, merged it, it split it wrongly. So all you do is there are split and merge functions. You just put two points on, on the two mitochondria that you want to uh, merge. You make them into one and then you split it. This just runs connected components, uh, which then creates this. And then you click on this guy right here on the C-shaped mitochondrion. And here you are with your final answer. This takes 30 seconds, 10 seconds. It's a small amount of time and you can just blitz through the volume and just go click, click, click without any manual painting uh, and correct your merge and split errors. And just to give an idea of it, you know, the liver mitochondria, these are 61,000 mitochondria, um, something like 95% didn't require any editing at all. 
there are a few areas where you had to do merging and splitting. A kidney uh, cells are much more complicated, but even there we were able to get about 80% and I think 65% uh, that had absolutely no requirement for any kind of merging or splitting correction. So here are all our resources. Um, I do have a, a, a movie if you want to see the entire uh, stack. Uh, perhaps I should. Perhaps I should show the the, the stack, um, which I, I'll probably do it during the question answer session. Session. It's it's open on a different uh, desktop. Um, the resources that we are releasing to the community are the CEM 1.5, uh, the older version of the CEM 500K, the CEM MitoLab, MitoNet Benchmarks, the MitoNet model itself, and Empanada. And the paper is now up on BioArchive. So the takeaways are many. I mean, this is a huge amount of work. So what we uh, hope that we show is that generalist models like MitoNet allow EM researchers to move beyond this endless cycle of, you know, annotate a small volume, test it, and then run it on the full volume. And because it's not generalizable, do it all over again for the next data set and so on and so forth. Right now, you can directly run, run MitoNet on any 2D or 3D EM data and fine tune if you need it. As I mentioned, it's very computationally light, so you should be able to do it on your laptop. Uh, what we show is that pre-training on this kind of very heterogeneous unlabeled data set improves model resilience. And, and note that, that those pre-training weights can be transferred to any deep learning model. You don't have to use it for MitoNet, you can use it for anything. And again, training on widely and sparsely annotated features increases generalization. So for those of you who want to attempt to do this for other features, we would suggest that rather than focusing on just densely segmenting a small number of volumes, sparsely segment a huge number of image patches. Um, expansion and versioning of these data sets because there's a company metadata should be possible. And so as newer and fancier model architectures come online, the data, it all boils down to the data, the data can be expanded and versioned and used appropriately. As this happens, you, we must increase even more the number of benchmarks and the variations of benchmarks to test these models. Um, and the point of doing direct instant segmentation means that you don't have to do something called watershed, uh, which is very slow and painful and error prone, even though it's automatic. So there you have it. Uh, Empanada is now ready to use for running model inference, fine tuning and easy cleanup. And right now you can also run model training as well. So the final conclusions for the entire talk, uh, I didn't go into the correlation because I think I really uh, delved deep into the computational aspect. So I think I should stop here. Uh, but overall, Volume EM, I, I hope I gave you some basic idea of the overall concept of the kinds of tools that there are, what it can do, what, what it can do, uh, what it can do and what it can't do. And this is an expanding field. Uh, you can do 3D uh, EM, imaging of microns to millimeters of samples at, at resolutions of tens of nanometers. Correlative approaches are very powerful and can reveal new biology in many systems. Automation and computation are key in volume EM pipelines and machine learning, deep learning appro approaches are alleviating traditional bot bottlenecks. Um, hopefully that these kinds of data sets will be expanded to create truly universal models. I've said for and I've left it blank. That was unintentional, but I meant for any kind of data. Um, and so that's where we are. I think this is there's a lot of hard work uh, left ahead of us, but a lot of dedicated labs are working on this. So I hope uh, that this will be um, an exciting area for research in the future. And lastly, I'd really like to thank everyone in our group, uh, the Volumium community and NIH colleagues, uh, and folks at the Frederick National Lab, uh, but all of this work was done by an extremely talented research analyst in the lab, Ryan Conrad, um, and so definitely reach out to him as well. You'll see that he's uh, active on some of these boards. If you have questions, uh, he has really done all of this work. So thanks everybody, um, and I'm ready for questions. <laughs>